uh, but the, the average pastor will tell you that most of the work in the church is done outside of the church, anyhow. And that there, there's only a small, limited amount of people who can be involved in a worship service up front. And I think that that is uh, uh, quite uh, clear. It's interesting though what Jesus said in Matthew, I think it was Matthew, when you know in his time there were a number of views circulating about who he was. Some were saying he was Elijah, Jeremiah, or the prophets. I say maybe because that he asked his disciples, but what do you think? I think mean, people are thinking all kinds of things. Uh, what do you think? And he said you, you are, are the Christ, uh, the Son of God. And then, interestingly, uh, Jesus seemed to suggest to him that, you know, based on that pronouncement which came from Revelation, I'm going to build my church and the wall, and, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So, I mean, in a sense, you may say he was speaking prophetically, but he himself knew uh, that the church would not have an easy right and, and that there will uh, be challenges. And that has been so historically for those who study the history of the church. And yet we know that the church um, has continued uh, to survive. And the church remains, I think, an integral entity. Not just in this society of ours, but across the region and across the world. It's interesting if you can picture in your minds what Barbados would be like without the church. Uh, uh, that, that's interesting. Um, as an organism as well, I think the church is still much alive. Uh, despite the challenges and the problems which we face, uh, we can talk about the, um, <laughs> the doctrinal differences. Uh, uh, we can talk about the you know, national distinctives. Unfortunately, I don't think we have fully mastered things to the extent that we can or should. Uh, cement around the what we call the essentials of the faith because really and truly it is the non-essential things of the faith that divide us more than anything else whether you worship on a Sunday or a Saturday in some churches whether you still should wear jewelry whether you go into church with a hat or not a hat and the myriad of non-essential things that divide us more than ever but within the context of the Christian faith whether you're anything Catholic or whatever, I think the things that make us a Christian, the things that make a Christian a Christian, we are all agreed on. But of course, it's the traditional things, the socialization in the context of our own unique churches that, as I said, we about the kind of divide that I'm not sure is in the best interest of, of the church. I personally think that the, the model, the model in the first century church was an excellent model. Uh, clearly defined authority, clear structure, disciples who were trained and called and commissioned. You had no doubt at all where the body of authority arrested. There was a, a strong sense of community. You remember in the early Acts, we were told that there was such a commonality, such an openness and a clear understanding as to what the role of the church was that they found it very easy to pool their uh, material resources. And I think the word said that no man thought that what he has was his own. But he was so committed to the cause. They were so committed to the cause that they pooled their resources to address immediate needs and one can say prospective needs um, as well. And I still think that that is a desirable um, um, dimension which is the church we cannot afford to lose sight on and must capitalize on. Of course, the expansion of the faith was also in the minds of the, of the early, early church. That was essential. Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. And Jesus said to them, you will begin at Jerusalem, extend to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So this whole question of a passive Christian in terms of not sharing, sharing his faith, it's not even consistent with dictates of Christianity. I'm sure our brothers in uh, Islam will tell you that too. But we, we're talking about Christianity this morning. Um, so you have to share and you have to tell. Why you don't ram things down, let's say, a person's throat? The point is 
that you, you, you make your faith known. You advocate that faith. And you're hoping, as a result of sharing and through the whole, the, the instrument, the mentality of the Holy Spirit, that you, you are so convincing and persuasive enough to make people to do what? To become a, a part of the Christian uh, faith. It is difficult today to be a pastor of a church. More difficult than it has been when I started over 22 years ago. Because church membership is not the same as it used to be. There are lots of back doors now to church. You can have members that will tell you, I don't have to come to church because they can sit and watch TVN and get the same word of God, the same preaching, the same anointing, the same ministry. It is difficult to manage church today because, as I said earlier, we have a different concepts of church. And so, while you might be very busy um, developing a vision and goals and setting strategies for accomplishment of those visions and so on, the other person down the road might just decide that they can have a church with six members and eventually five of yours go over in one month, five of the other person down the road go over the next month and in a, in, a, in a couple of months, that particular church might have a congregation and they built a lot from congregations across the island. So church is a lot difficult now, more so than before. And also because we are in the last days and people are more fickle than before the Bible spoke about it. That men would have itching ears, would, you know, would seek to have teachers of their own kind. And I'm not being critical of any congregation. I'm talking in general. And so the only thing that would keep us as a church, that would allow us as ministers of the church, as visionaries, to be able to retain our congregation, to be able to fulfill our goals, and to make sure that all of the, the mandate that's been given to us by God has been accomplished, is to have engaged members. We can no longer afford to have members that will just come to church and we will not see them maybe for the next month or two months. Maybe see them at Easter, Christmas, the Christmas, Christmas and Easter members or the cave dwellers. We need in order to accomplish the goals and the vision that God has given to us as a church and as pastors, we need this imperative that we have a congregation that's made up of engaged members. I first heard the term engagement over a year ago when I attended the NICE Employee Engagement Index meeting when they were reporting on the survey results. And I'm one of those persons who believe that whatever is given to me must be a tool used to help me to better manage the program that God has given to me to better able to serve my people and my country. I want to suggest that our, our journey, or people come to, to faith or to church commitment in various ways. And the faith we have and the commitment we may have to our church is nurtured by many things along the journey. The first one I want to highlight is the family. For the faith that I have is the faith of my family. The denomination that I am committed to or engaged with is the denomination of my family. It is true that some persons may change denominations, but there is no big change. Essentially, it is still the, the Christian denomination. So the family plays an important role in terms of helping persons to be engaged and to be committed. We have a story in the Old Testament where once Ruth accepted that she was part of the family, she said, your God shall be my God and your people shall be my people. All the my, your people, my people, your God, my God. So it has to do then with 
that kind of acceptance that we are a part of a family. For the, our values are shaped by the way we use the experiences we have in our families. In our, my own denomination, when persons bring children for baptism, we invite them to make a commitment. We ask them to see that this child is instructed in the creed, the Lord's Prayer, etc., etc., and uh, that this child is brought back to become a member of the church through confirmation. I do not say that those promises are honored in the breach. But there is that desire to have persons committing themselves and eventually being engaged. The second point I want to make in terms of why I think there may be a lack of commitment and awareness has to do with the growth in the knowledge and the awareness. To some extent, such a growth uh, probably causes persons not to be too quick to commit uh, uh, themselves. If you do not know or you do not understand something, you would most likely attribute that which you do not know or do not understand to God, to that power <coughs> that is beyond you. With the, the growth of knowledge and the ability to understand and have more experience, then persons may think of God as a less attractive or dependent option. I know now, therefore, I do not have to be as dependent on God as I was in the past. So we develop the idea of the God of the gaps. Some will argue that there will always be gaps in human life, so therefore, there will always be that need for God. Added to all of this, life today seems very natural and routine. And that sense of mystery, which was fascinated, seems not to be present in the same way now. The third point I want to make is that a modern scholarship, I think, has brought a new interpretation to the Bible. And for many years, Persons have been taught certain aspects of the Bible in a particular way. Today, modern techniques may show a difference between what the texts say and what the tradition practice. For some persons, that may be a little bit confusing because we have been taught that this is what the Bible says and uh, there is no deviation from what the Bible said. But modern, modern techniques create some problems for some people. For instance, for Christmas, how will a persons deal with the Pope's words that, uh, as we would think the portrayal of Christmas? No animals, no singing angels. Would that make a difference to some people in terms of their commitment to church, their involvement with the church? With change as rapid as it is today, there may be some persons who are holding back on the, their engagement. I think that is true for church as well as for the world of work. The fourth point I would like to, to, to make is that with new avenues for social and emotional solace increasing, the need for the church may be decreasing. I know the presenter says or said that churches that place for 
the spiritual, the spiritual, etc. And if you don't want that in the church, then you could join some other service club. Right, you I think the the internet church or whatever you want to call it is an interesting dimension we have to look at. In fact, there are pastors who are part of that kind of arrangement. Um, already it's like what's happening in education, Mr. Chairman. Um, I suppose the birds are being across the institutions, including KFL, realize that we have to be, you know, facilitate those persons who, who would like to have an education but they can't physically be there. And I can tell you though that um, it does not necessarily work down your education, but let's say those of us who have been trained and had to be physically in an institution will tell you that there's a dimension that comes to that training that you wouldn't get online. The, 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 the development of relationships, the conflict as a result of rubbing shoulder to shoulder with people, you can't get that online. <laughs> you know? Um, but I think it is suggest, true to suggest that um, I, I think the models are still there irrespective of the context, but it's the application, the application of those models, you know, will change from society to society and from place to place, but I still think that the church remains a necessary and a vital